We all have a creative part of our brain, whether we use it or not, for generating new ideas, problem solving, and just viewing ourselves in this world. I am Ricky McGeckron, an artist living in Chicago, and I am eager to know and share with you all how people of a creative leaning have brought this way of thinking to the forefront and how it has shifted outcomes. I am proud to say that I am a cook. You can drop me in any kitchen or kitchen-like environment with good basic ingredients, and I will be able to produce a great meal. I don't need fancy tools. I don't need a recipe. I will make something of quality that is unique to me and unique to what is available to me. This will not stress me out. I will love the process. I have learned the rules of cooking. In fact, these rules, habits, and processes are hard-coded in my brain. Because of this, I can move forward in the kitchen with confidence and focusing on making the dish my own. I don't have to spend brain cycles ensuring that I am doing the cooking basics well, Instead, I can open my mind to being creative. When I was in my 20s, I lived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I had no friends, lived alone, and worked from home. Oh, and I was in a job I hated. Yes, this sounds sad. It was a bit pathetic. Anyhow, I needed something to bring comfort in my life, and I focused my energy on health, fitness, and nutrition. And this made me start cooking. I started picking up cooking magazines from the grocery store, I remember Cooking Light was a big one. This was during the low-fat craze, so I don't recall going through as much olive oil as I do now. There was an incredible fancy grocery store right down the street from my home called Zagara's. So ingredients that I needed, any ingredient that I needed, Zagara's would surely have. My weekends were spent finding recipes, planning my trip to the grocery store, and cooking. I would cook Friday night, all day Saturday, and Sunday. I would cook for the week, fill my refrigerator with food, and fill my freezer with food. I entered into all of this with basic cooking skills. This went on for a few years. Soon enough, I was a solid recipe follower. You could give me any recipe, and regardless of the technique that was required, I was able to execute it with confidence, with little fuss, or really much thinking. I had learned the rules of cooking. At some point, something changed. Something shifted. I found myself being able to prepare awesome dishes without a recipe. Now I would go to Zagara's with no preconceived meal plans and just be impressed with a fresh ingredient, a vegetable or a nice cut of meat. And I was able to use these ingredients to make a risotto, a quiche, a savory turnover or a hearty soup just from my own head. These dishes were no longer the execution of someone else's creativity and idea. It was my creation. I was no longer a recipe follower. I had become a cook. I had learned the rules, broke them down a bit, and made it my own. Oscar Joya is a Chicago-based artist. Born in Lilongwe, Malawi, he was exposed to drawing at a very, very early age. An eventual move to the United States stimulated and fueled his artistic activity. He went to an arts magnet school and studied art in college, focusing on the human form. For certain, he has learned the rules of painting and drawing. Oscar's story and his work are a wonderful example of learning the tools and using these to move things forward. His paintings are anchored in the foundations of portraiture, But he has extended this in a style that is unique and reflects his past, his experiences and values. He has learned the rules and made them his own. Your artwork is very unique. It's very vibrant, colorful, and I'm very curious how you got to the place where that is what you're creating. It's it's very visually um, unique. How did you start in art how did i start in art God. um so i guess I, i'll try to condense it because it's like a long origin story i don't want a marvel marvel like story but um <laughs> my mom and my auntie will always draw like like simple stuff like teddy bears just something just to keep me entertained and i started copying them when i was younger and what, a- got, what age would this be this would be probably around the age like probably between one and three and around that time, I was drawing on walls, drawing on anything that, that I can literally draw on. And ever since then, I draw through things I like. I loved cartoons. I loved film. 
So I was like drawing what I saw, and most of them was Disney films. So, but right around the time Tarzan came out, which is 1999, I was about six. I was really fascinated by that film, so I started trying to draw the the artwork from Tarzan. And ever since then, especially coming from you know I'm a Malayan South African native, and I'm as soon the minute I started moving to the United States around the age of seven and eight. I drew. I was. There's a lot of things that the United States had to offer that we didn't have, like anime. And I drew from anime, and then from there, I slowly discovered things that I eventually liked, like you know, like a lot of realism. And then from there, I went to the American Academy of Art right as soon as I got out of high school. And then I tried taking a lot of my teachings there, which is a lot drawing a lot more realistic, a lot more sculptural, and everything like that. And then I kind of drew upon my interests, my things that I liked, I was passionate about, like music, film, and animation, but, and I try to kind of mimic, like mimic and replicate it. And I eventually kind of arrived at a point where I was like, I kind of want to tell a lot of things that I was, you know, from my perspective, a lot of things that I've seen. So I've always liked remixing things and contorting it to the way of how I visually see it. So I want to know about your auntie and your mom drawing for you. <laughs> that is an incredible way to entertain a baby. Why? That seems kind of unique. I don't really hear of parents drawing for their children to entertain them. Yeah. Like, I don't know what got them to do that for me because they, they just knew I liked it. And it just made me smile and stuff. So my parents, my mom and my auntie will always do the like, they made a teddy bear with like nothing but six and nines and everything like that. I was like, I always liked it because it's so simple. And then I just started copying that and that that just for some reason avoid it caused me to not draw on walls anymore and just draw on paper. <laughs> now, did they read you stories as well? I mean, was this just a supplemental entertainment for you? Yeah. Or is that the primary thing they did to entertain you? No, it was a supplementary entertainment. Um, my mom usually just like just sang songs for me and my family, I come from a musical family like they usually sang for choirs and stuff and they've always done that to kind of like be, uh, act as my entertainment but okay. I just found a lot more enjoyment and a lot more just tangibility through drawing okay so there was they were doing all sorts of things to entertain you and something about the drawing activated your brain yeah is that, is that okay and then it sounds like you were doing that in drawing and you were no longer drawing on the walls. <laughs> and so that was kind of part of your childhood. I can definitely relate to this because I was the same way. Yeah. Um, drawing was a big part of my childhood. But then it's, you moved, how old were you when you moved to the United States? I was seven years old. So it was the year 2000. We were just, we, we just wanted to, you know, have a fresh start in another place. And we, at the age of seven, I moved to South Bend, Indiana. Okay, and uh, and so you were like in second grade, or was that accurate? about to be in second grade? Yeah, about to be in second grade. So, as in terms of what you were doing for art, what were you? What were you doing? Were you when you arrived in the United States? What was the thing that you were doing for art? Oh, sure. Well, um, what do you mean? Sorry. You so mean. I'm trying to figure out, like, you. I'm assuming you were on some sort of artistic trajectory that got changed when you got to the U.S. because you mentioned that there were new things here. Yeah. So tell me about like how how did that change? How did it shift? It was kind of like in a way almost like a zero to 60. It was kind of like zero to 60 miles per hour. The minute I arrived here and just a, like just get a lot of visual stimuli, uh, I just was like, whoa, there's so many things I can that a, I can draw. I actually have the ability to draw and be there's just like it just fascinating because um, I always thought the what I drew was very kind of simple but now it's just like it is it's very complex it's very you know dynamic and very like in your face so I've always just was interested and wanted to draw that now when you arrived here you there was all this new stuff and mm -hmm. so your brain is being stimulated in all sorts of ways was the whole I can draw this was that a big part of it or was that just one of many things that were going on in your head? It was just many things. It's just like... Like, was that a big part of your life? Drawing? At, uh, that, at that point. At that point, yeah. Because it was just like, as much as I like getting action figures and toys, but the fact of ability, for some reason, I just get more satisfaction by drawing it because it's like, I can kind of make it 
and like making my way and everything like that so it's kind of the way of you know like how people play with action figures and everything like that that's the same way that's the same kind of enjoyment i get from drawing just that i can kind of play with what i'm drawing gotcha okay so it sounds like the fact that you can put your own influence and spin on what you're observing is a big part of your creative process is that is that yeah. accurate like it sounds like that was something that happened from what you just said that yeah. happened early on yeah it's like i'm not just copying <laughs> but i am making it my own right yeah because i remembered um i vividly remembered when because when i first came here like the biggest thing that caught my attention was sailor moon and dragon ball z the latter more so was an influence so i just wait what were those two things sailor moon and dragon ball z i don't know what those are so there's like just really well-known anime from back in the day okay but like i've always been enthralled by them it's just very dim dy again dynamic and very visual like just visually stunning so i just drew that and try to make my own spin and of everything i've always liked that any kind of media, whether it be television or film or music, or what have you, it gives you room to kind of like make your own, make your own, like, you know, infl either get something from what the, what you're absorbing or kind of create your own, so you can create your own interpretation in the future. And eventually you'll kind of develop your own voice. Okay. Yeah. In terms of gaining formal training. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you were creating artwork by i'm assuming there was no formal training you were just copying and is that accurate in a way uh i did get some kind of formal training um i did have art did take my art classes in, in like grade school and it was only until high school where a few of my teachers actually try to help me find a path and at least like hone in and just reel in my skills a little bit more because I did draw kind of in a scattershot way. So they just helped me reel it and find um, a way, like a, not a style per se, but like a tone that I should shoot for. Okay. And did you, how did you respond to that? Were you okay with being given guidance like that? Did you resist it or did you, were you totally into it? Very little resistance. I was so excited for it. Um, uh, yeah, Miss from Miss Wynn to Miss Miss Degan to um um Miss Romans, they kind of like helped find like trying to you know like slowly introduce new things. If I'm excelling on one thing or struggling one thing, they'll try to find a way to kind of sidestep or try to find a way to kind of like you know introduce in like a new element. So from graphite, there's like oh you suddenly understand graphite. Let's try charcoal and so on and so forth. Was this high school? Yep, this was high school. And what were your teacher's name? My first teacher was uh, Miss Degan. She kind of was my intro, my my fundamentals art teacher, and then it went straight to uh, Miss Wynn, and then eventually to Mr. Romans, and then eventually to um, Mr. Brown and Mr. Love. And they kind of all of them slowly introduce us a new element that I kind of now kind of keep in my back pocket as far as like creative arsenals. Wonderful. Now was art a big part of your school system and your high school yeah yeah in my high school of course i was an, a magnet student too like i was part of a school program where not only was i supposed to take visual art i was also supposed to learn music supposed to learn drama drama and theater and band i my big focus was art because that's what i liked and i was more passionate about though um i did slowly find other interests in other other sectors in my school as well it's okay. it pretty cool. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Yeah. That sounds great. Now, you went to school for art for college. Yeah, yeah. The American Academy of Art uh, downtown Chicago. Okay. And what was that like? Oh, man. Was it, that like, because you were the, I assume you were somewhat of the art star in high school. And then when you go to art school, everyone was the art star is that <laughs> is that accurate no i actually no like i never really was the art star or anything i just was more so like i was constantly having to like prove that i can do what i can do because usually i would draw the same stuff from like elementary to early high school it's kind of drawing the same thing and then i as soon as like my teachers start introducing new elements i was like oh, okay i gotta keep building and building and building and it was more so like I was excited to go to college. I really was because it's like, oh my God, there's like, there's like-minded people. There's people that I can, you know, relate to and, you know, th things I can learn from. It was just a completely new, like, 
community that I was super excited to get into. And I knew it was going to be um, extremely difficult because I was like, that's what I wanted from my training was just to like see how far, far I can be pushed. When you went to art school, did you have to t study all sorts of art or was it specifically painting? Like how does how does it work? Is there like like I went to school for engineering? Okay? Yeah. <laughs> so in engineering, everyone, regardless of what kind of engineering, yeah, the freshman year, it's all the same. <laughs> right. Um. So is art school the same way? Yeah. Like freshman, like the first year, it's just kind of like you know basic fundies and uh, life drawing, and then you know you have your like your additional classes like English and and anatomy, but it which is kind of cool, and then people slowly uh, branch out to their major. For me, I didn't starve as a, I was a painting major for all but two seconds and then I switched to life drawing because I was like, yeah, I can't do this. I can't paint. So um, I switched to life drawing and tried to learn like art in the most like fundamental level. So it's like if I ever do try a new medium, I will feel very comfortable doing so it. So your training is with, so life drawing, is that um, like full models or is it fate, uh, portraiture as well? Uh, it's full model and it can also be portraiture. It's just like how the figure interacts with the environment. You're basically using simple tools like charcoal, pastels, basically dry medium that you're just kind of like trying to see if you can build up on and try to see what, like um, pretty much capture what you see with the human eye. It teaches you how to like sharpen your eye, it teaches you like, spatial awareness composition it even teach taught me like really good design which yeah it's kind of fun sure yeah i mean i've studied i've done some um live model drawing yeah so um i know it's definitely one of the hardest things to do yeah but it's also really good training regardless of what kind of artist you are because it um, it calibrates the accuracy between what you see and what you put down on the paper. Exactly. Because you don't need an art teacher to tell you if anything is off even the, the smallest bit, your brain will register that the figure is off. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I, yeah, and I do credit a lot of that uh, training to my professors because they, you know, um, most of them just kind of calibrated everything. And for me, they're just like, you know, if I... Because I used to be very, it's like, I can do this, I can draw this, I can do this. And then they were like, then my professor said, it's like, no, you can't. You can't do this. You got, you got, you got to check. You know? So I got really humbled really, really quickly yeah. when I got to college. But it was all for the, for the best. So tell me about your work that you have going on now. I know that you have an exhibit in January mm -hmm. at um, Gallery Studio O in Ravenswood. Yeah. It's a group show. Um, I got to see some of your work in person um, a couple months ago, and it was it was very interesting. Thanks. So tell me, based on everything that we've talked about, now we're here, and this is the work that you are creating. So tell me about that work, and how does that history that you just, in this background that you just told me, how does that um, feed into this work that you're doing? I think, well, to kind of start off, I hit that stride to where it got me to that body of work like not too long like within a year or so and i really looked into what pretty much makes who i am my like my upbringing my heritage but also looking at like the things i i'm very interested into so it's basically i've always feel like me personally i'm very dichromatic like i'm very like i'm just like there's a like two two components running at the same time like I've always been appreciative of my traditional elements and my digital elements, and I want to slowly collide them together bit by bit. So, is there a digital component to the work that I've been seeing? Yes, there is. Um, for a while, I've been messing around with digital, and it's always digital and traditional have all been separate. So, recently, I've been combining them quite a bit. But physically, it's all traditional. But when I when I use elements are like augmented reality there's also a digital element so i've been combining a lot of like you know physical like traditional elements like you know that you see like you know tribe like like my tribal markings my patterns you know focus on, on african-american figures or people of color and just just crank it up and just make it very futurist bring it more not even just to the current but more so to the future just yeah. bring those elements so i try and make it make what i do as futuristic as it gets so it's kind of like in a sense more i would say like black panther it's like black panther and like like blade runner like just a lot of things 
colliding in, into one. Now, a lot of the portraiture, there's a, a lot of portraiture in the work, at least the stuff that I've seen. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that layer. I assume that's what you do first. Yes. Now, is that all? That's not digital. Nope. Okay, so you're basically taking your training, yeah, uh, and then you that so that's kind of the starting point. Mm-hmm. Tell me about eyes, the eyes. Um, so I do really enjoy painting eyes, and usually from all the art I've seen, that's always like the first thing that people catch. Like it's just like you know the eyes, like you know gateway to soul and everything like that. But I've always liked the idea of omitting things and just like seeing what, what else can come of it. I've always thought like crossing out the eyes was just like a nice way of just like a, the reality distorted, like reality distortion. Like, you, you know, you're not, and this is like a reality that's either of my making or the reality that's you're unable to access. So I've always wanted to play up that aspect. And it's also like, you know, it's also taking like ownership. It's like, you know, you don't get a chance to really see the eyes and everything. And I kind of was like, it's like, well, you already know what eyes look like. You already know what they look like. So you can kind of like mentally like replace that picture and you can really tell what, where things are going with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a, that's a lot there. Yeah. It's very loaded. It's so to kind of like zero it, zero it down. It's more so like removal realities. It's a reality that's, you know, not accessed in the, in the physical it's also like, so. Tell me about that removal of reality. What do you mean by that? Um, since my work is like very Afrofuturist and very like surreal, it just like kind of like informs the viewer like this is like this is like you know different reality. This is like a completely different thing. Going so you're on. making it obvious to them yeah. that this is not a standard portrait. Yeah. So exactly. let's just let's just get that off the bat. Right. <laughs> uh, when you first look at this. Okay, so that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Um and then you said then what was the the next thing that you said? The no- I think you said something about no access. Yeah, it's just like you know when people are like it's like when things are restricted, like you know, when you're you know when you're kidding then there's like it's like do not enter sign and you're just like, "Oh, I, I kind of want to see what's in it." Mm. It's like that. It's kind of like that. It's like, yeah, there is a thing there, but you're not going to access it. Oh, and it's the important thing when you're looking at a portrait. Yeah. The eyes. Okay. I like that. Yeah. It's really, it's really fun. Yeah. How long have you been doing that? Oh. Um, you know, how did it come? Did it just come one day? Or? Yeah, it kind of did. It just <laughs> showed up. I was just like, ah, it's like I kind of like that because I've always liked that um, that anonymity. Anonymity? Anonymity. Thank you. This okay. anonymity to like visual art so when people cross eyes or scribble things i've always kind of done that like as just a thing especially with my figure drawing back in college but uh last year i kind of started messing around with it and i was just like i really like where this is going i kind of want to keep working with this yeah yeah because it's kind of like a nice sense of like set of goggles in a sense of it's like my my own visual goggles i guess So I've been doing this for about almost like two years now. Now, what about your use of color? Using highly saturated, highly chromatic. How long have you been doing that? Uh, That's a good question. Or not time, but like when did that happen? Was that something in college or is that something recent? It didn't show up until post-college. I think it was, um, I mean, I did a little bit in college, but just with very little like awareness and then when i started shifting my focus to more people of color i've always liked playing up this is like 2016 i was like i really like the idea of when people say people of color i'm like all right yeah it's like you know we're different races and everything like that but i like wanted to play that aspect up to it's like it's like to like a, a crazy degree so i wanted to make it's like all right these are people of color i'm painting i'm gonna make them people of color so i make the saturations bright vibrant actually even plays up their personality a little bit because you know studying color and everything and what color emotes i've always just enjoyed that so. yeah there's also a lot of loose um use of patterns mm-hmm. and uh, where does that come from uh, i came from my uh my heritage of uh, my african heritage we've always like one thing that i've always remembered especially like a lot of our our clothing is there's a lot there's a lot of use of patterns a lot of you know either tribal or very floral part patterns and as I've I've been here in the United States, I've also picked up a lot of patterns from elsewhere that we can kind of that are kind of similar to ours. So I slowly started just using the patterns into my work as well. Now, do you ever go back to where you were born? 
No, not not as of yet. Um, but one day I will. Now, do you remember it? Oh yeah, I kind of have a pretty good memory. Of what What do you remember? Um, what about it when you think back is so different about from what it what your life was when you moved here? I feel like both here and back in Malawi, there was a sense of adventure. I've always enjoyed that kind of part of that. I, that was remembered. I remember, you know, walking around with friends, playing playing sports. I've always remembered just long, like, like long walks, you know, from, from town to town and everything. But not town to town, but like, you know, from place to place and everything. And I, I do that here. Like I walk everywhere and I've kind of kept that sense of um, that, that nomadic spirit. So I've always wanted to just, even though it's not vividly captured in in my work, I kind of like always use that as a creative, a creative like influence. Like I'm always um, excited for the next step in my evolution. I'm always like like venturing out and trying new things and finding new things. And that's how I've kind of, you know, blend both my childhood and my time here. Okay. You know, you had mentioned when you, when you moved here that, you said zero to 60 in terms of stimulation of yeah. different things. Do you ever think about what your art would be like if you didn't move here and you didn't have all of that um, stimulation or that, you know, the change of stimulation? I actually don't know. I th uh, That's a good question, man. <laughs> um, no, I never realized what it would have been if I stayed. Maybe I would have been, from what I, if, if I was cognizant of what my reality would have been if I moved when I moved. I'd probably be a lot more of a of a, just drawing realistically, which I kind of already do. So I'm guessing I wouldn't be too far removed. I probably would find this would have found this path eventually. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Now are you doing art full time right now? Yeah, I'm doing art full time. Uh I had a day job and for a while and then recently I just took a leap of faith and just I'm doing the full the full time art life and it's pretty it's been pretty fun. Really it's really fun. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Now is it how do you keep things moving for yourself? And do you have any issue with um staying inspired or or is your limiting factor like time? I think it's just time. Um I'm constantly inspired. I just I it was just also like a a like um a, a like a blessing and a curse because i'm always constantly thinking about things and thinking about how i can create like i can create this one image or creating like one thing and just going just going back and forth so I, instead of like thinking from a to z i'm always thinking from a to a to nine or something like that I just i skip letters and go straight to numbers and everything it's it's kind of it's kind of weird but it's i'm my brain never really turns off <laughs> i can totally relate to that yeah so, well, that's great that you have a, um, an outlet for it Yeah, because a lot of people's brains, and it sounds like you're, um, what you're able to produce is aligned with how your brain is working. Yeah. Cause I think a lot of people have active brains and they have no outlet for it. And yeah. that causes a lot of problems. Exactly. <laughs> it becomes really stressful. It does become like very annoying. Cause you're just like this days as you just like let me just turn off my brain for like two seconds but it's lends itself pretty pretty handy because it does kind of open you up to new to new to new opportunities and new ways to express now do you spend a lot of time with other visual artists in terms of like your friends people you hang out with yeah i kind of not most not only just visual artists but just people that are just fascinated that just in the arts in general so from musicians to you know writers and even just people that appreciate art but they don't do it themselves i've always liked finding myself in different kinds of crowds just helps you know you kind of pick up and pick up what they're putting down and you know channel to your own yeah do you ever think get inspired by um people that like inspired to in your paintings by people that aren't painters like a musician or a writer um, it's funny did you say that because most of um what i'm influenced are mostly musicians then they're like like i do take influence from some visual from visual artists and just like visual art in general but i've always been fascinated by music and just like like what music can kind of you know tell visually 
I guess in a sense, I do have like some some kind of like synesthetic um, approach to my work. So for my listen to or what I try to like, I try to hear. So I can't play music very well. I like to kind of create music visually, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 So it's just kind of nice. So that's kind of how I've channeled it. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> you use the term Afrofuturist. When did you start identifying your work as that? Or was that something you tried to do or how did that all come about? Only t about 10 months ago, I started identifying, like less than 10 months ago, I started identifying myself as an Afrofuturist. I just basically said I was a surreal artist, but I felt like I was like, that's not necessarily where I'm at. I'm not, uh, I've, and I was very, very aware about using like, like our labels, like um, like a like a representationalist or surrealist and everything. I was worried about that, but when I finally found my voice, um, I was like, "All right, this is what is like." I'm Oscar Joya. I'm an Afrofuturist, and that's and yeah. So that's why I started. So about less than ten months ago. I'm not familiar with that term. Uh, yeah, like it was. It came around. I think I don't remember when, but like it didn't start it started picking up steam about like the, the halfway through the 20th century a lot of uh, a lot of writers um especially like i think octavia butler she's one of them like she used she's a well-known all right well i'm gonna have to do some research on this <laughs> yeah no it's all good it's all good and um like carrie Car james marshall he's a really well-known like his work is has afrofuturist themes tell me about some of the artists that you like or are inspired by um I've always been a huge fan of uh, of like Keith Haring. I've always been a huge fan of his patterns, just the way he like you know his simple, yet very graphic approach has always been very fascinating. Have you ever seen any of his work in in real life? Yeah, I did. Um, I saw it at the when it was at the um, when it was at the at the cultural center. Like I think last year I went, and I was just like. I need. I just happened to be there on a whim, and I, and I was super excited because it was so cool. Was it like a a traveling exhibit type thing? I'm not sure because I think it was like part of the like he painted some school or something, and then he just brought it in, and he did like well, I mean his estate or people that own the work brought those tiles in, and it was this large, really really large, almost looks like a wall in a sense of his work and it was really cool because it's very expressive very animated and just seeing that person was just like it's like just incredible so i went to pisa italy and yeah. he has a huge mural there what yeah right when you come out of the train station it's gigantic dude really um yeah it's really cool and they have plexiglass it's a it's you know right in outside but they have plexiglass like six foot wall protecting it um, I'll show you photos of it. Oh, I didn't see that. It's super, super cool. Yeah. It was kind of the highlight of the trip. Almost, almost as exciting as the Leaning Tower. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, that was really cool. Yeah. And then I know that um, his, there is a building in New York. I think it's like a gay and lesbian center or something. And he has painted... He has a painting um like up a whole stairwell. Yeah, if I'm right. And yeah. and um it's I think it's a a stairwell that they use. Um so it's pretty crazy. I'm gonna have to I'll post um on our interview on the what um you know, when I post this interview, I will post a picture of it. I'll do a little bit of research. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, I, I don't know when he did it, it's probably like towards his end of his life or like a little bit what like towards the hype of his like like his popularity. I've always, I man, there's so much I really want. I really want to see a lot of his stuff. Really, really, really do. Yeah, uh, I wish they had like a traveling exhibit of his stuff. Like they have, because I just saw the Andy Warhol exhibit. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Yeah, have you seen it? No, not yet. I was at the Art Institute. So, um, and I was thinking, I wonder if they ever did anything with Keith's work, like a traveling exhibit. Yeah, I so, would love that. Yeah, yeah the Warhol, Warhol exhibit is pretty cool. Did you know he started as an advertising illustrator? Yeah, I did. So they have yeah. a lot of that stuff. They have a lot of his illustrations that he did, and um, it's pretty good. His work is very is very diverse. Yeah, and it's he has a lot of film. Um, he has a museum in Pittsburgh as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yeah, that's where he's from, and he has there's a whole Warhol museum there. 
Yeah. But, uh, well, cool. Now, what about musicians that inspire you? Ooh, man, I, I got a larger list. I'm going to try to condense it. Um, I've always been a huge fan of like people like, uh, Bjork, like she's really incredible. I've especially like she, she's the type of people that combines different elements. She, even though with her music, she combines visual elements that I've slowly like taken notice and started incorporating like my work, like even though I have a painting, I'll try to have like another visual element along with it. And I've always... What do you mean? Like uh, two visual elements in one painting? Yeah. So you have the physical element and you always have like the digital element, which is the digital animation that I add along with it. So I've, since, like I mentioned earlier, like I mess with augmented reality. So I try to find different apps so you can just scan my piece and my piece has a second life to it. So it's kind of like in a way it's like you have the you have the... You listen to the song on Spotify, but you also got the live version that you get mm. to see. So it's, I've always liked that approach of that. And and you were kind of inspired by her? Um, She was like the one that, I wouldn't say that super inspired, but like she was a big influence. Um, People like Childish Gambino, uh, JPEG Mafia, De Death Grips, they've always had a second life to their work. Um, So it's, they're not, they're more than just a musician. They've become like full full-fledged artists performing artists even so i've always wanted to have my work have a second life uh, outside just the physical painting that you see okay great yeah so your approach to your art it seems really unique in that especially around this stuff with the augmented reality so it doesn't seem like you're in a box what would you recommend to people that are listening to this that for how they can break out of a box and to really fully find their true creative expression. Um, I kind of took this note from um, from Jackson Pollock actually, and I'm not in the big, I'm not the biggest Jackson Pollock stan, but I've always liked that he just kind of just does things very loose and very just not serious. So for in my way and. A few of my friends, we always just sketch a bunch, just do sketching, paint, just, just you know, paint whatever. Not, not really at like being anchored by a specific pro, uh, subject or idea. Just work things out, and you just and just you know let things let things go. You know, just kind of like think of it like an improv, like an improv jazz session, or like just you know like a jam session. Just do it. Just pretty much just do it in a way. Okay, I like that. Think about it as an improv. Yeah. I, I'm going to take that advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that's always fun. I felt like that's, if it wasn't for, like, just the random time just sketching and just, let, just like, you know, letting my, letting, like, my brain and just everything just shut down for a second, just let the, just let the hand and the heart work, work in, in, in kind of, like, on beat and everything. That's kind of how I've, you know, became like the artist that I was I was supposed to be. How did you learn that? I mean, did you were you a little bit more serious, and then at some point you loosened up and let the hand and the heart connect? Uh, I've kind of done that. Like after school, especially in college, I just usually take my free time to sketch whatever I felt like, and just like you know apply what I learned a little bit, but. As the years gone by, I just became, I was like, I kind of, I was just like, you know what? I just feel like sketching whatever today, you know? And through those like, m like small experiments, I, it became, you know, it just slowly became a part of my, of my artistic toolkit. And then the more I kept experimenting and it just slowly started building up kind of like a, like a tree sprouting, sprouting branches. It's, it just became a small seed that I planted. Okay, and the and the water is the activity of just c keeping in front of the sketch pad and staying in front of your easel. Yeah, yeah, because that's that's always been that's always been like the exciting part is just you know if you're if you like love what you're doing and you kind of you eventually get into ruts and you get into like you know a part where you just don't you just like it's like ah I'm just too hung up on an idea just you know I feel like just doing just straight up doodling just straight up doodling at a coffee shop or wherever and just let the brain like like you know let the brain shut down and let the heart and the hand work its thing let the heart and the hand 
work its thing. Let the brain shut down and let the heart and the hand work its thing. Yeah. That is amazing advice. And I think we should end on that note. <laughs> and I am definitely taking that advice. Thanks. Yeah. So thank you so much. Where um, where can people learn more about your artwork? You can find my work at uh, www.oscarjoyoart.com. Or and how do you spell that? O-S-C-A-R-J-O-Y-O-A-R-T. Or you can find me at Oscar Joyo on Instagram, but it's O-S-C-A-R underscore J-O-Y-O. Okay, great. Thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. My name is Ricky McGeckrin, and you have been listening to Eager to Know, the podcast. If you haven't already, please go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join me next week for another Eager to Know podcast.